<clears throat> Chapter 2 The night was clear at the moment, but scudding clouds across the face of the full moon promised more squalls. Hugh Paston turned up his coat collar and made his way through the sordid streets on foot. It seemed to him inappropriate to arrive in the narrow street in a taxi, creating a commotion and drawing attention to himself, and giving the visit an importance he did not wish it to possess. Moreover, his head ached from the steam heat of the hotel, and his inner restlessness demanded an outlet. The wet freshness of the gusty wind that he met at street corners was welcome. It cooled his face and gave him something to struggle with. The dark, too, was welcome after the glare and publicity of the hotel. Just as, earlier in the evening, he had longed for light and crowds. So now he welcomed darkness and solitude, his moods following one after another in rapid succession. He felt himself to be capricious, unstable, mentally and physically feverish. At the moment, he walked vigorously, full of pressing life, that he could find no aim or outlet. He didn't know what he wanted, and if he got it, wouldn't like it. He felt irritable. If anyone jostled him, he would get shoved and sworn at. He suspected that his feverish energy would be short-lived, and that in a few minutes it would turn to a dragging weight, as it had done so often before, when the one thing he would want would be to drop into a taxi and be taken home. And once home, he knew the restlessness would renew itself, and he would be too weary to sleep. This was the cycle he had been repeating for the last few days, and he had no reason to believe it had changed his track, save that he had gotten wearier, the phases were shorter and more extreme, and the changes more violent. It came to him, in a moment of insight, in the windy darkness, that the thing had cracked, that had cracked him up was not the breakup of his marriage. That had been the occasion and not the cause. The trouble had been brewing for a considerable time. The, tr the trouble had been brewing for a considerable time. It amused him to realize that he who had at one time had read psychoanalytical literature at the bidding of his wife in order that they might have something to talk about it at dinner parties when such subjects were the vogue, was now getting a close-up of the disintegration of a personality. Without knowing how he got there, he suddenly found himself outside the second-hand bookshop. Late as it was, it was all lit up just as he had left it. He laid his hands on the latch of the half-glass door. It yielded, and he entered, hearing its warning bell clang as he did so. He heard someone stirring in the inner room, the shabby serge curtain was thrust aside, and the bookseller appeared, blinking in the hard glare of the unshaded incandence and looking at him inquiringly. For a moment, Hugh Paston did not know what he had come for. His mind was slipping its cogs, and it scared him. With a Herculean effort, he pulled himself together and managed to say stu stumblingly, you said you had another book on the same subject in French, I think it was. And the situation was saved. At least he hoped it was. At any rate, the bookseller accepted him in a matter-of-fact manner as an ordinary customer. His face showed no surprise at the oddness or of the demand or the lateness of the hour at which it was made. Had Hugh passed and had his wits about him, he would have known that the very absence of surprise indicated that he might just as well withdraw his head from the sand as his tail feathers were clearly visible. Though, of course, he had no means of knowing that shortly after his previous visit, the Voltron bookseller had been out for his usual evening stroll after shutting up time and buying his usual evening paper, had found an illustration on the picture page in which the press photographer had been lucky enough to catch one face clearly. The face of the chief mourner at a certain sensational funeral. 
and staring at it, had murmured to himself, poor devil. So that was why he wanted something exciting, but couldn't be bothered to read a foreign language? The, book the bookseller studied his visitor for a moment before replying. Ah, yes, he said at length. Hosman's Labas is the book you are referring to. I have it here. Your mention of it roused my interest in it, and I have been dipping into it again myself. I have also remembered that I was a little rash in saying there, there are no books in English on the subject of the Black Mass. No books worth having, that is. I do not call sheer sensationalism a book. There is nothing, so far as I know, strictly on the subject of the Black Mass, but one or two interesting books on cognitive subjects. The Devil's Mistress, for instance, and the Corn King and the Spring Queen. Perhaps you would like to look at them. I've got them here if you would be so good as to step this way. He drew back the tattered curtain that hung in the doorless gap between the bookcases and passed and followed him to the, into the inner room. He had never been in the room behind a shop and the experience intrigued him. Half the world does not know how the other half lives, and he was about to have a glimpse of a side of life that had never been opened to him before. He hoped it would distract his mind. He found himself in a smallish room, too lofty for its size. There was a, grass, a gas bracket, but it was not lit. Such light as there was came from a green shaded oil lamp that stood on a small table beside an ancient leather covered armchair drawn up to the hearth. The lamp threw a small circle of gentle light onto the chair. The rest of the room was in a dim warm gloom for the fire in the old fashioned grate was low. Serge curtains trimmed with a gap toothed ball fringe were drawn carelessly along across a long French window on the wall opposite the doorway by which they had entered, and beside them was a half-open door through which the corner of a sink was visible. The walls were lying to the ceiling with booksellers stock in trade. Piles of dusty books filled the corners of the floor. A small kitchen table covered with a coarse blue and white check tablecloth occupied the center of the room and was the only bit of furniture in the place that was not cumbered with books. A wooden chair drawn up beside it indicated that it was the dining table. The absence of a second chair indicated single blessedness. The fireplace under its white marble mantelpiece was a beautiful bit of wrought ironwork with high hobs at either side, on one of which a, a black earthenware teapot stood warming, and on the other a heavy willow pattern plate. An exceedingly ancient and mangy gray goatskin hearth rug and an exceptionally heavy set of fire irons completed the equipment. Upon the opposite side of the hearth to the armchair with the lamp at its elbow was a big broken springed leather covered sofa of the same breed as the chair, its seat full of books. The bookseller disposed of the books by sending them to the floor with one sweep of his hand. If you will be so good as to take a seat, he said, indicating the broken springs. He passed and sat down and found them much better than he had anticipated, discovering to his surprise that a sofa of this breed, even if broken springed, was a very much better thing to sit on than the chairs in his own house. He sank back into its roomy depths and relaxed. I'm afraid I'm keeping you from your supper, he said. Not at all said the bookseller. I haven't begun to cook it yet. I have only made the tea. Might I offer you a cup if you would honor me? It seems a pity to let it stew and be wasted. Hugh passed and accepted, not wishing to hurt his feelings. Tea was not one of his beverages at the best of times, and this was not the best of times with him. His mind turned in the direction of old brandy, and he wondered whether it would be after hours when he got back to the hotel and felt pretty certain that it would. The bookseller produced two large white cups with narrow gold lines round them and an odd little gold flower at the bottom of each. 
He remembered having seen similar ones in the potting shed of his boyhood's home. He believed they were used for measuring out weed killer and insecticides. At any rate, no human being drank out of them. Into these roomy receptacles went some milk from a bottle. Soft sugar was shoveled in with what looked like a lead spoon. And then a stream of rich mahogany fluid was applied from the broken spout of the black teapot. This, said the bookseller, handing him a cup, is a man's drink. Hugh Paston was rather startled to hear such an epithet applied to a cup of tea. But as soon as he sampled it, he knew it to be justified. It was hot. It was strong. It was rich in tannin, and although it had as much kick as a cocktail and bore n not the remotest likeness to tea as it was understood in his wife's drawing room. By Jove, he said, that's good stuff. I think you've saved my life. Have another cup? I will. Another cup was dispensed and drunk in a companable silence. He passed in, in his tail coat on one side of the hearth and the old vulture in his dusty dressing gown on the other. Hugh had a sudden flash of realization that with this man one would not touch surfaces as in Mayfair. If one touched him at all, one would touch the real man. And he felt that in some curious way he had touched him. And to that human touch, <clears throat> something in him <clears throat> suddenly clung desperately like a child. The old man had eyes of a very bright, light bright blue, deep set under superciliary ridges like a gorilla, and overhung by eyebrows that would have served most folk for a mustache. He was clean shaven, and his tan leathery skin hung about his chops and folds, after the manner of a bloodhound. His mouth was large, thin-lipped and humorous, very like a camel's. Hugh Paston, at first sight, had taken him to be somewhere in his eighties, but in actual fact he was a battered and dilapidated sixty-five, looking much older than he need on account of his dressing gown, a garment usually associated with the infirm. He, for his part, looking at the man opposite him, judged him to be in the early thirties but that whatever might be his actual age, he would never look a young man again. He wondered wh whether he had been deeply in love with the woman who had died with her lover and surmised that he had not. There was a hungry and restless look about his face that is not seen on the face of men who have loved, even if they have been crossed in love. This was a man, he thought, who was unfulfilled. Life had given him everything he wanted and nothing he needed. Lack of spiritual vitamins and a racketic soul was his diagnosis. He judged that there was too much idolism in this man to start him drinking, but that he would prove rash and erratic in all his doings unless a steadying hand were laid on him at the present juncture and probably rush into the wrong kind of marriage or a ruinous co-respondentship with some woman for whom he cared not a single hoot. He, for his part, had a her hearty contempt for Mayfair and all its ways and works, and the contempt was genuine and not of the sour grapes vintage, for he held that the average inhabitant of that district would never be able to keep his head above water in a competitive world unless he had a swimming bladder tied to it in the shape of inherited money. Had he been kicked out into life through the gates of a council school, he would have landed in the gutter and stopped there. So honest and complete was his sense of superiority that he had to overcome a kind of inverted snobbishness in holding out a friendly hand to the man who had not been the architect of his own fortune. He was watching his visitor carefully and observed that he was settling down and relaxing and being not without experience in the ups and downs of life himself. Knew that a reaction was on its way and the fellow would soon feel more dead than alive. He wondered what could be done to tide him over his bad patch. I wonder if I might offer you some supper, sir. 
it is getting late and I don't know what you are, but I'm getting hungry. Yes, by Jove, now that you mention it, I am. The old man moved off through the door beside the French window, lit an incandescent burner, and passed and saw a little build on kitchenette, small as a ship's galley. The pop of gas indicated a stove, a gas stove behind the door, and in a few moments there was a noble sputtering. The old man came in with a second plate and put it to warm beside the fire. The heavy black kettle was restored to the hob. Eggs and bacon suit you? He inquired. First rate. Couldn't be better. Two eggs? Rather. It is a surprisingly short space of time the bookseller reappeared with a loaded tin tea tray and began to shuffle a miscellaneous collection onto the table in the middle of the room. Everything was rough but clean, with the exception of the knives, which were not stainless and had not seen a knife board for years. The old man looked at, the, at them doubtfully. Then he went over to the mantelpiece and clearing it out of books by the same simple method that he had cleared the sofa, began to use one end of, its, of it as a knife board, slapping the knives backwards and forwards on its white marble surface, felt their edges with his thumb, and return them to the table. There's one thing about marble mantelpieces for cleaning knives, he said. It saves the monkey soap. Now we're ready. Will you come along? He plunged his hand into a huge pile of books that rose in a far corner, groped among them for a moment, gave them a shake that spilled them onto the floor in an avalanche, and drew out a second kitchen chair, which he carried to the table. They seated themselves. Hugh passed and thought he had never smelled anything so good in his life as that bacon, or seen anything that looked as attractive as the crisp edges of the fried eggs as the bookseller served them out on the frying pan in which they had cooked. They fell to. The old man did not seem disposed to talk, and Hugh passed him, who felt as if he had not had a meal for a week, did not feel disposed to either. They ate in silence. At the conclusion of the meal, his host put the black teapot back in its place on the hob and filled it up from the kettle. Then he shuffled everything onto the tray with a terrific clatter and deposited his load in the kitchen. <clears throat> I hate garbage, he said, having rendered this service to sanitation. Then he returned to the now blazing fire and began to fill his pot. Chapter 3 Hugh passed and was half asleep over his cigarette. His feet stretched out onto the fireside stool and a cup of the well-stewed tea beside him. The events of the last painful days, even his married life with Fritta, seemed to have slid into the remote backward and abyss of time. The old bookseller, looking at him, saw that he was more disposed to go to sleep than to do anything else. He rose, went to the window, drew back the curtain by its snaggletooth fringe, and peered out into the darkness. Nothing was to be seen. Rain ran in long streets down the glass. A furious drought drove through the cracks and swayed the tassel on the cord of an undrawn blind. Beast of a night, he said, dropping the curtain back into place and returning to the fire. He passed and roused himself wearily. What time is it? I suppose I can get a taxi. Getting on for late. No, I don't know how you'll get a taxi in this district. I'm not on the phone, and the pub at the corner is shut. Have you far to go? Hugh named his hotel. Good Lord, what are you doing there? God only knows. I don't. I couldn't stand the house, so I cleared out. It never occurred to him that he had told the bookseller neither his name or history. Yet, he took it for granted that the old man knew all about him, as in fact he did. The bookseller looked at him thoughtfully. You can't go back there. No, you certainly mustn't go back there. Look here, sir. Can I offer you a bed for the night? You're very welcome to one if you care to have it. 
That's dash kind of you. Yes, I'd be very glad. The old man took the lamp in his hand and led the way into the shop. In one corner was a narrow wooden stair with no handrail, no better than a glorified stepladder. Up this they mounted, coming out through an unrailed hole in the floor like the entrance to a hayloft. Apparently the shop was of the lockup species, but its owner was also the tenant of the mansionette over it, and had solved the problem of having to go out to go to bed in the simple but adequate fashion. He passed and wondered whether the landlord knew and whether he minded having his timbers cut in this happy-to-lucky manner. Looking round, he saw that everything was covered with a thick layer of gray dust through which wound paths made by the feet of the occupier. Where he had no occasion to go, the dust lay undisturbed. He wondered whether he had been wise to accept the offer of a bed. They went up another flight. A bit of faded old felt carpeted the upper landing, but it looked as if it were shaken out of the window from time to time. A fish-tailed gas burner turned low, cast a faint illumination. Through an open door, he caught a glimpse of a high old-fashioned bath, badly in need of a coat of paint. His host opened the door next to the bathroom, entered, and set the lamp down on a bureau. Here you are, he said. No bugs, I guarantee that. That's all I can guarantee, though. He thought to himself that, considering the state of the stairs, he was glad to have this guarantee. His host disappeared to return in a moment with a faded old pair of flannelette pajamas, minus all the buttons and most of the seat. Here you are, he said. Sorry there's no buttons, but the cord's intact, and that's the main thing. Left alone, Hugh passed and took stock of his quarters. The bed was not exactly a four-poster, but had two high poles behind, from which a, a canopy stuck out in a cockeyed fashion, threatening to come down and hit the sleeper on the head at any moment. Curtains of faded red damask hung from it after the unhygienic fashion of an earlier age. Hugh got out of his clothes and got into the seatless pajamas and slid into the bed, which consisted of huge, fat old feather mattress, half a dozen washed-out blankets, and a faded patchwork quilt. Hugh had never slept in a feather bed before, and was immensely taken with it. He pulled the curtains forward cautiously, the canopy creaking ominously as he did so, and tucked them under the mattress to keep off the drought from the dilapidated sash window against which the storm beat in howling gusts. From somewhere near at hand, presumably on the tiles, came the well of a despairing cat. That was the last he passed and remembered. When he awoke, it was broad daylight, and his host, still in the same old dressing gown but with pajamas under it, stood looking down at him with an immense mug in his hand. Here's some tea for you. There's a can of hot water over there, tucked under the corner of the carpet. If you want a bath, you'll have to go out to the local wash house for it. Baths busted. I sat through it last summer. Anyway, there was no way of heating the water. Get up when, I, when you feel like it. There's no hurry. I've put my razor on the mantelpiece. He waved his hand and departed. Breakfast was one of the most agreeable meals, thought Hugh, that he had ever eaten. The teapot stood on the hob and kept really hot, and they made toast on their forks in front of the glowing coals. It only needed a dressing gown like the old booksellers and a pair of carpet slippers to be perfection. They were smoking peacefully, sharing the paper between them, when an old char lady came in. What about food? she demanded. Sausage and mash, I think, for lunch. The usual for supper and a beefsteak pudding for Sunday's dinner. That suits you, Mr. Paston? Hugh woke up with a start. Good Lord, are you going to keep me here over the weekend? 
You're welcome if you want to. You're not in my way. I reckon you won't care for the weekend at home very much. My God, no, I shouldn't think I would. Knowing that blasted hotel, I am everlasting grateful to you. The bookseller grunted. The old dame grunted also, took up an enormous bag made of black American cloth, and sallied forth to do the weekend shopping. As the shop door clanged shut behind her, Hugh passed and turned to his host. I say, why are you doing all this for me? The old man wagged his tufted brows at him. G-O-K, he said. Paston laughed. Yes, he knows, but I'm not in his confidence. You've heard my story, I take it. I know what's in the papers, and guess the rest. There's no rest. The papers got the lot. The old man did not answer. Well, I'm damn grateful to you anyway. God knows what I'd have done to myself if I'd had to spend the night alone in that hotel. You probably wouldn't have spent it alone, said the bookseller with a slow smile. No, I probably shouldn't. Being after hours, that was the only resort left open to me. So much for Dora, God rest her soul. The bookseller rose. I've got work to do, he said. Make yourself at home. There's plenty to read. Don't let the fire out. He disappeared through the curtain into the shop. Left to his own devices, he passed and put his feet up on the sofa and settled down to his cigarette. Uncommonly comfortable quarters, he thought. The general shabbiness and dilapidation counted for nothing. The old bookseller had got the essentials of real comfort. Among the grubby cushions lay the book that had been the alleged reason for his return to the bookshop the previous evening. He fished it out and commenced to flick over its pages. Skipping skillfully, Hugh made his way through the novel. Bluebeard did not interest him particularly, not the pointless French love affair. It was Canon Dulcer he was after, Le Formidable Chanoin, and he found him as elusive as Dertel had done. Finally, however, he ran him to earth and settled down to chuckle over the pages in which he celebrates the Black Mass, tastefully got up in a chasuble embroidered with billy goats, socks and suspenders, and nothing else. He couldn't see anything horrific about it. it. It appeared to him simply funny. Presently, the old bookseller finished his chores and returned to the room behind the shop. Once the mail, once the mail orders had been dealt with, there was apparently nothing to do for the rest of the day but sit around and wait for casual customers to drop in. And as the weather was worse than bad, it was improbable that they would drop. I say, jokes, said Hugh Paston. Can we do anything to this sofa? I'm gradually going through. Certainly, my dear lad. Why didn't you mention it before? Always ask for anything you want here. It's yours for the asking. And he flung himself flat on his face at the hearth rug at the feet of the startled Paston, who thought the Black Mass had begun in good earnest. But he was wrong. The old bookseller merely wanted to peer under the sofa. Ah, he said, I see what's amiss. Springs have given way. He reached out a long arm as he lay there and drew towards himself a pile of loose books lying about on the floor and began to stow them scientifically under the sofa. There, he said, getting up and dusting his knees. That's the best use I know for the modern novel. That's chapter three. Goat foot God.